Thanks for joining us. Our webinar today is all about the persistent myth that using Odirect takes care of data reliability in Linux. Thank you, Kyle. Let's get started. Embedded devices used to be like this Panasonic cassette recorder. It captured data onto a non-volatile and non-permanent media where bit errors and loss of data could occur, much like today. It had no memory buffers. All the data was captured and stored at the speed of the media. This device also had no worries about timeout or latency, and only minimal loss of data when the power was interrupted. In other words, the path take, that the data takes from the point of capture to the media was extremely direct, unlike today's modern devices, where the direct path to the media is frequently enhanced with caching in an attempt to create the perception that writes occur at the speed of the media or even in excess of the media. Today's data path is similar to this metro map pictured here, with standard and express routes, added lines for file system metadata, and the like. Sometimes we just want or need to take the most direct route. Today we'll look at the Linux OS and how capture data reaches the media. What sorts of performance enhancements can stand in the way of reliability? Some of the commands and options available to allow more direct data capture. We'll also show how Odirect is not the complete reliability solution some Linux developers believe that it is. The direct path is simple, but processing data at the speed of the media is also extremely inflexible. To handle cases where data is captured at a higher rate than the media can handle, some sort of buffering solution must be used. Those same buffers can also allow the data to be pre-processed in some ways, including compression and encryption. These sorts of improvements allow the data gathering to be completely separate from the data storage, and this results in complete flexibility at that media level. In Linux, Memory is segregated into kernel space and user space, and each contains buffers of various types. The majority are contained in various kernel space modules, primarily the virtual file system. One example is the kernel page cache, which optimizes reading and writing. These buffers can have different goals for optimization, and each has its own controls to make changes. These controls can force the system designer to choose a trade-off between performance and reliability. Unfortunately, not all these controls are documented in the same location. For today's talk, we'll focus on Linux kernel 4.9 and the associated file system revisions. We'll also touch on Linux flash file systems and Datalite's Reliance Nitro, which is a third-party file system for Linux. Several of the buffering solutions we'll discuss are related to the Linux page cache. These and other caches can take several approaches to writes, but there are three broad categories. A write around cache has writes bypass the cache entirely. The data is transferred straight onto the backing store. A subsequent read will result in a cache miss, and therefore the data has to be read from the backing store also. A write through cache copies the written data into the cache so it can be used for subsequent reads, but immediately transfers the written data to the backing store as well. The write does not indicate completion until the transfer to the backing store is complete. And then a write back cache copies the written data into the cache and indicates completion immediately. Data written into the cache is, is marked dirty and is written to the backing store at a later time, either asynchronously or in response to a flush request and that's assuming it isn't invalidated first. Android is an application environment that runs on top of various Linux kernels. SQLite is native to Android, and many apps supplement ordinary file I.O. with the secure solution of an SQLite database. This software will add its own reliability functionality by performing the writes in an atomic fashion and then committing them. SQLite assumes that write operations will be reordered by the operating system and the file system. For this reason, SQLite performs a flush or F-sync operation at key points. Assuming these operations will not return to the calling program until all pending write operations for that file handle have been completed. An application 
can write data through a variety of system calls, like fwrite or write, or via various library functions or other high-level programming languages such as Java. In some of these cases, the I.O. functions include user space write-back buffering. A prominent example of user space write-back buffering is the streamed I.O. functions which are provided in the C library. If one of these write functions, fwrite, fprintf, or fputc, is used to write to a file, that write is buffered in user space. An application can force those buffers to be written into the kernel buffers by means of an fflush system call. However, that write is still write back cached by the kernel. fflush does not include an fsync or anything similar. Conversely, system calls like fsync are not always aware of the streamed I.O. buffers and will not flush them. Uh, the fflush is necessary to move the data to the lower level of buffering and then the fsync to actually flush the data to the media. Alternatively, a set vbuff can be used to disable the streamed I.O. buffers or to flush them automatically whenever a new line character is written, which is useful for text data, for instance, uh, in which case the F flush should be unnecessary. Also note that an F close includes an F flush. As another example, uh, consider a Java application. Many types of objects may write back buffer data, such as Java IO buffered writer. The flush method of that class and other classes implementing the flushable interface is similar to the F flush from the C library. It will write the data into the kernel buffers, but it does not flush those buffers to the non-volatile storage. A comprehensive review of all the user space caching is not really practical in this session. Application developers just need to know what types of caching exist for their application. Mistakes in this area, like assuming F flush includes an F sync or vice versa, could lead to unexpected data loss. So that's the Android uh, environment and the applications themselves. But really, let's let's dive into the Linux kernel. The Linux virtual file system is set up to support write back caching of file data and certain metadata. Each file system, for example, ext4, ubifs, etc., has a great deal of control over how this caching gets used. And the file system often has its own metadata caching and can implement additional caching for file data. Allocate on flush, which is also called delayed allocation, is implemented in some Linux file systems. This feature holds the pending block writes and subtracts from the free space without allocating the blocks. When needed, the file system then allocates large groups of blocks and commits all the data at once. This can help minimize file fragmentation and increase performance, but it does increase the risk of lost data due to power interruption or other system failure. The Linux page cache is a cache of physical pages. Each page typically has 4KB of data on ARM and x86 CPUs, although other, spaces, other sizes are possible. Uh, one example is 8K on a Spark CPU. A page is attached to an address space and has an index, which is used to sort the page into an efficient radix tree. Commonly, an address space is attached to a file inode and used to cache file data, with the page indices representing offsets into that file. A file system might also choose to use the page cache for metadata caching. For example, directory data could be cached in an address space attached to a directory inode. Artificial inodes can also be created as containers for special purpose address spaces that cache metadata not associated with any particular file or directory. The page cache, as it's typically used, is write back. Uh, written data is copied into the pages, which are then marked dirty. The dirty pages, unless invalidated, will be eventually written, either in response to an application request, like fsync, for instance, um, or in a background by the kernel flusher thread. Kernel flusher threads have several tunable criteria. We'll discuss those later. Uh, those control when the pages are written out. For example, pages which have been dirty for some length of time, for example, 30 seconds, may be targeted to minimize uh, data loss in the event of system failure. The kernel flusher threads might also write out dirty pages to relieve memory pressure. When a dirty page is written to the media, 
The file system is responsible for deciding where it should go, uh, assigning a block number, before it is submitted for the write. The VFS takes care of submitting that physical I.O. Writing a page of file data might not be enough to make that file data persistent. Often the file data, even if it exists on the storage device, is inaccessible until the associated metadata has been updated. If the file data was appended to the file, the file size has to be updated. If the file data was written to a previously sparse offset, then the metadata has to be updated to save the location of this newly allocated data. Uh, even when overwriting existing data, a copy on write file system needs to update the metadata to store the new location of the data. File systems are largely responsible for how their metadata is cached. Usually there's a block device inode with an attached address space for pages. File systems also have different policies as to when dirty cached metadata gets written. For example, ext4 has a commit interval uh, which defaults to five seconds, and you can tune that via amount option, which controls how often the cached metadata is written. Reliance Nitro and its default configuration is semantically similar to ext4 with a time transaction interval of five seconds, and that's tunable via both mount option and a runtime ioctal. For file systems which use delayed allocation, and that is most of them, the writing of cached metadata is generally independent of the writing of dirty pages. Thus, it's possible for the metadata associated with the write to be committed prior to the write data itself, which can result in unexpected behavior. Uh, as one example, when appending to a file, the increased file size, the, which is a metadata update, might be committed prior to the actual new file data. If the system crashes at that point, after the metadata commit, but before the dirty pages were allocated and written, then the appended area could read back as zeros. It's also possible to read back something other than zeros, data which resided at an unwritten allocation block, which is a definite security concern. Certain file system mount options, uh, for example, Reliance Nitro's flush on extend mount option, can mitigate this type of behavior with a downside of decreased performance. You have to write something extra. DAX, uh, that's an ab abbreviation of direct access, is a mode supported by some file systems, uh, namely ext2, ext4, and XFS, to optimally support RAM-like, non-volatile memory storage. Such devices can be read and written just as fast as RAM, so the page cache is on unnecessary overhead, and DAX bypasses that overhead. Another bypass mode is direct I.O., that is, from files accessed with the odirect flag. And that'll also bypass the page cache, but in the process will not flush the hardware cache. Even that's not su completely sufficient to guarantee complete reliability. And to prove that, we tested odirect. This test that we created does nothing but measure the performance of sequential writes in four different cases. On this platform, the media was capable of 225 megabytes per second, roughly. Using neither ODirect nor F-Sync, the speed of our I.O. was 4,000 megabytes per second. It's basically all cache. When we turned on ODirect, that slowed that down by an order of magnitude, but the performance was still faster than the maximum for the media, where our write speed was faster than the media could, could possibly do. If we slow down the media by using the F-Sync option, then the performance drops to roughly what we'd expect, with or without ODirect. This basically proves the point of ODirect by itself is not committing, not committing all the data to the media in order to get that, that I.O. speed, that write speed. And so for reliability purposes, when the data absolutely has to be on the media, you either need to write very large files, which bypass everything anyways, or use F-Sync. ODirect is just not enough. So once we leave the file system, all those data and metadata calls give the same result. They're blocks, they have to be written to the media. As an aside, the common Linux flash file systems do not use blocks in the same way that other file systems do. The flash device drivers in UBIFS, JFFS2, and YAFFS do not present memory as a block device, but instead as something used directly by the associated file system. 
An, an alternative to this for raw flash media is Datalight's Flash FX Terra that prevents, presents raw flash media as a block device. I won't go further into this topic today, but there are certainly other materials that do so. Beneath the file system are several optional block device caches. These can be hardware caches, which we'll cover later, or software caches. The general principle of them all is the same. Use a small but fast storage device as a non-volatile cache for a large but slow storage device, thereby achieving speed without sacrificing capacity. For hardware caches in a typical desktop or enterprise environment, an SSD is used as a cache for a rotating hard disk. An option for an embedded system might be to use battery-backed RAM or some other non-volatile RAM, such as FE RAM, as a cache for a managed flash device. Two software block caches are included in the Linux kernel mainline, bcache and dmcache. Both have similar goals and features. The differences are mainly technical. Outside the kernel, there's also flash cache, which was originally developed by Facebook. There's a fork named Enhance IO, which was developed by STEC, and also Intel's Cache Acceleration Solution, which runs on Windows in addition to Linux. All these software options support using the cache device in both write through and write back modes. Either way, once the data has been committed to the cache device, it should be persistent, even if it's not been propagated to the backing device. In write back mode, bcache and enhance IO do not acknowledge I.O. completion until the original I.O. and any necessary metadata are stored persistently on the media device, whereas DM cache writes its metadata once per second or in response to a flush request. In general, applications don't have to do anything extra to ensure data persistence when using a block cache, at least if it's configured correctly, that is. The block layer is responsible for managing a queue or multiple queues of I.O. requests. These requests can be reordered as an optimization and are passed down to the device driver to be serviced. The old implementation of the block layer uses a single queue and supports several IO schedulers to reorder the requests. The new implementation, block MQ, uses multiple queues to reduce lock contention. IO scheduling is planned, but incomplete. As of Linux kernel 4.9, both approaches are supported, but the long-term plan is for block MQ to supersede the older single queue implementation. So the request queue and IO schedulers, uh, this implementation uses a single request queue per block device. The IO scheduler may merge the requests for adjacent sectors, sort them, reorder them uh, by sector address to minimize rotational latencies and time when those requests are submitted. There's three IO schedulers included in the mainline kernel. The completely fair queuing, CFQ, is the default scheduler. It prioritizes the I.O. based on process and priority. No op, well, that's a scheduler that uh, uses a simple FIFO queue. It'll merge adjacent requests, but it doesn't reorder them, which is appropriate for storage media like flash memory. There's no rotational latency on flash memory. The deadline scheduler attempts to service all the I.O. within a certain time limit to avoid starvation. Outside the kernel, there's also the budget fair queuing, BFQ scheduler which was developed as a replacement or alternative to CFQ, and it claims to deliver lower latencies and higher throughput in many use cases. Efforts to merge BFQ into the mainline kernel have mostly been rejected since block MQ, as which we're gonna detail next, is seen as the way forward. So block MQ, instead of maintaining a single queue for each device, has a per CPU or even per core queue for each device. This reduces lock contention allowing the block layer to scale up to millions of IOPS. Device drivers are in the process of being converted to support block MQ, either exclusively or optionally. Notably for uh, embedded systems, the MMC driver did not support block MQ as of Linux kernel 4.9. Block MQ does not yet support IO scheduling, which has been observed to hurt performance on media with rotational latencies, but that is not the direction of embedded design. So now we're going to leave the Linux kernel and return to the, go even lower uh, to the hardware caches. But first, the device drivers required to deal with that hardware. 
A simple device driver merely takes a request from the queue and converts it to the appropriate command set for the storage device. Many device drivers attempt their own optimizations, and some of them, like the SCSI driver, are multi-layered and complicated. Delving into the individual configurations and options is outside the scope of this presentation, but some general information about hardware caching does apply. Some rotating and solid storage, solid state storage media hardware includes internal write back caches for written data. The device driver issues the appropriate commands to flush the hardware cache when a higher level flush command has been passed down. For example, the SCSI driver, which is used for USB storage, might synchronize, issue a synchronized cache command, or a SATA driver might issue a flush cache or a flush cache EXT command. While nearly always true today, this was not always the case. Uh, it's entirely likely that there are storage devices still in the market which have a hardware cache but do not support the flush command. Uh, if you're using such a device, it might not be possible to guarantee immediate data persistence. And it's definitely something worth uh, checking out, understanding, and or testing for, uh, but probably asking your vendor to be the fastest way. The majority of embedded devices these days utilize flash media for data storage. Uh, and that these hardware devices often have their own cache. In this case, a buffer is used to improve NAND write performance, helping to hide any additional required erases behind the scenes. An additional benefit is the reduced write amplification by allowing entire write pages to be filled before committing them to the NAND media, considerably less overhead can be required. This could result in longer lifetime for the flash media. In the Linux flash file system UBIFS, this additional buffer is called the write buffer. UBIFS uses a number of MTD write buffers equivalent to the count of journal heads. Each is the size of a NAND flash media page and is only used for smaller writes. The larger writes bypass this buffer. JFFS2, an earlier design, is also similar. Uh, any of the techniques that we've described here to commit data to the media immediately can work against the goals of performance and write amplification on flash media. So if you absolutely need reliability, you might hurt performance and or lifetime. Uh, that's the balancing act here. Uh, while many embedded system designers don't give much thought to storage, uh, balancing these two competing forces should be a goal for every designer. So that's our brief overview of all the various caches from top to bottom. Now, let's go back and briefly cover how we can control them in the uh, seven minutes we got remaining. Our goal is to answer the question, how can we get the data to the media as directly as possible? Linux system calls are passed down to the underlying file system and are the same for each. Several system calls will forcibly flush dirty pages to the non-volatile storage. Sync will flush all the dirty pages and inodes for every mounted file system. SyncFS uh, will flush all the dirty pages and inodes for every mounted file system. FSync will flush the dirty pages and inodes for a given file or directory. Uh, FDatasync will flush the dirty pages for a given file or directory, but will only flush the inode if doing so is necessary to access the dirty pages. Each of these system calls are synchronous. They do not return until the pages or inodes have been written and the block device has been flushed, or at least given notification of flush. If the file system needs to update any metadata to point to the updated inodes or data, for new allocations or copy on write file system, then those changes will also occur and be flushed to the non-volatile storage before the system call returns. Open modes can be used instead of explicit syncing. If a file is opened in OSync mode, then every write to that file descriptor is synchronous, as if it were immediately followed by an FSync. If open in ODSync, then every write to that file descriptor is synchronous as if it were immediately followed by an F data sync, and we covered those on the previous slide. Two misconceptions have arisen in the common practices of all Linux application developers. The close system call does not provide any synchronization guarantees. Linux does not flush dirty data when the file descriptor is closed. In some Linux file systems, calling F sync or F data sync on a newly created or renamed file does not necessarily ensure that that entry in the directory containing the file has also reached the non-volatile storage. For that, an explicit F sync or F data sync on the file descriptor for the directory is also needed. Some applications use F sync or other flush calls very frequently. 
hurting performance and increasing ride amplification. Uh, often F-Sync is just being used as a mechanism to ensure the correct ordering of the data, even in situations that do not require the data to be forced all the way to the permanent storage. Uh, if this is known to be the case, uh, Reliance Nitro could be configured such that F-Sync and Sync will provide ordering guarantees without taking the time to commit everything to permanent data storage. Again, a transaction point, though, would commit everything and so then give you reliability. It's a nice balancing act there. As mentioned earlier, the kernel flusher threads automatically flush dirty pages based on tunable criteria. Uh, pages which have been dirty for a certain length of time will be written. Uh, if the overall amount of dirty data is above a certain threshold, they'll be written. Uh, these automatic writes are asynchronous. So the flusher threads initiate the writes, but don't wait for their completion. Now, the kernel flusher threads do not flush the storage device, so the written data may remain in the hardware cache. So data written by a kernel flush of thread is not guaranteed to be persistent unless there's been a synchronous flush operation like sync, system call, or a file system commit. All the automatic flush settings are exposed in the files in the proc system VM directory. Current settings can be seen by reading these files, and new settings can be written to these files, although you obviously need root privileges and it's not persistent across reboot. The dirty expire sentence X uh, tells you how old dirty pages must be before they're old enough to be written. Um, the current value can be read with a, a cat proc uh, sys vm 30 sentence X. The usual default is 33,000, which is 30 seconds. Uh, setting a lower value can reduce how much data is lost in the event of system failure. Uh, if you wanted to lower that value to say uh, 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 10 seconds, you could, you could put 1,000 uh, there. The kernel flusher threads don't run cons constantly. So even after a dirty page is eligible to be written, it might take a while for the flusher thread wakes up to see that. Uh, how often the threads wake up can also be controlled. Uh, that's, that's the uh, operation here, dirty write back seven seconds. Uh, the default there is 500, which is five seconds. Um, lowering these settings can reduce the number of dirty pages, which are at risk of being lost in the event of system failure but there can be downsides. If we reduce, uh, reduce throughput, uh, increased file system fragmentation because there's less time to collate uh, pages and then of course increased wear on the media. If a write back cache is filled to capacity and then flushed all at once, this can introduce long latencies into the system. And so one solution is to start writing the dirty data once it exceeds a certain threshold. The kernel provides tunable settings for this also uh, updated and read the same way we just discussed, dirty ratio and dirty background ratio. Uh, or as a mutually exclusive alternative, dirty bytes or dirty background bytes. The kernel documentation is going to cover the exact meaning of these settings, uh, and we are short on time. So, assume we're using ext4 with the default mount options. Dirty expire sentasex and dirty write back sentasex have their default values. Uh, and the amount of dirty data in the system is insufficient to trigger, trigger the dirty background ratio or bytes threshold. So after dirtying a page, how long before that's committed to the non-volatile storage? After 30 seconds, the page will become eligible for a write. It could be another five seconds before a flusher thread wakes up and sees that that page needs to be written. And then the data can be stored in the hardware cache for up to another five seconds before ext4 says, hey, commit intervals expired, and that journal commit issues a flush. That's a total of 40 seconds, not counting the time needed for code execution and data transfer, of course. This calculation is similar for other file systems, except the ext4 commit intervals are replaced by the equivalent mechanisms. Uh, for Reliance Nitro, for instance, uh, the configurable timed transaction interval, or for UBIFS, a non-tunable three to five second timeout for a write buffer. So of all these, uh, runtime changes are only available on Reliance Nitro. The Linux kernel and file systems have added complexity to improve performance and media lifetime with the consequence of increasing the amount of data at risk. And that's the balancing act we embedded developers have to run to all day. Dirty data can stay cached for a surprisingly long time in the default case, but the developers have options to control for this behavior. Uh, what we've done today is examine many of the commands and options available, uh, understanding these complex underlying mechanisms for how data is committed to storage is crucial for the developers to effectively balance data at risk and performance.
especially crucial in embedded systems where resources are limited. And the devices operate in volatile environments where sudden power loss is likely to occur. Choosing a highly configurable file system, one that can be changed at runtime, will also help quite a bit in this case because then you can adjust for those situations on the fly as opposed to only amount of time. Uh, we also have a white paper available which delves into all this topic in better detail. Uh, and I believe we might have a few minutes for questions. 